All right. Hey, welcome everybody. We still have some people joining, but I, I guess we have most most people here now. Uh, first, uh, there will be a recording. So if you if you want to share this to your colleagues, uh, you're gonna get a re recording and uh, and uh, you're able to share that. Uh, secondly, welcome everybody. A few sort of house housekeeping things. Uh, if you have any questions at any point, there is a Q&A feature uh, on, the, on Zoom. Uh, we're going to be using that for taking questions. And feel free to put in questions at any time. We're going to be uh, taking them either at the end of, uh, end of it or, or then during if it fits, uh, fits well with the conversation flow. Uh, and then in terms of timeline, this will take about an hour, maybe if we have a lot of questions, maybe a little bit more, uh, but, but about, about an hour is what we're aiming for here. Okay, that's it for housekeeping. So let's, let's start with introductions. So uh, we, have, we have a bunch of three amazing people. Uh, I don't know if I can kill myself amazing, maybe, maybe that's not okay, but at least we have two amazing people and then, then one we're not, we're not so sure about. So, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you guys introduce yourself, uh, selves. So, so, Mike, you can go first. You're, you're first on my screen. I absolutely. Do, do you, wanna, you want me to introduce the company to you? Or introduce yeah, you? go ahead. Introduce yourself and, and the company. Fantastic. Thank you, Eero. I, I count you as an amazing person. I've always enjoyed working with you. So I really want to appreciate you for uh, hosting this session. Uh, I am Mike McCourt from uh, SIGOPT now. Uh, we are called SIGOPT, an Intel company, uh, because although we were founded in 2014 by uh, Scott Clark and Patrick Hayes, uh, last November 2020, we were acquired by Intel, which has been a really uh, exciting shift, and uh, we've been able to work on a lot of interesting and exciting projects, both inside Intel and then uh, continuing to uh, expand outside of Intel. And in particular, what we've been focused on for our entire history has been on uh, the model development process, uh, starting first with that hyperparameter optimization focus and saying to ourselves, how do we make smart decisions around uh, model hyperparameters? And then pushing on to think some about uh, this tracking process of uh, model development. How do you track how your model has developed over time? And then how do you make sure you can orchestrate things somewhat effectively, especially in this uh, parallel computation setting? We have a few core value propositions, really, at SIGAP. Uh, part of it is this question of integration. How do you uh, facilitate this interaction of hyperparameter optimization with all of the various different elements of model development. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, sample efficiency really also is a key driving factor of SIGOP. How is it that we can be as sample efficient as possible, reduce the number of required trainings of your model and still find you the best model that we can? And uh, in particular, scale. How is it that with some of the uh, decision-making process that we facilitate at SIGOP, how is it we can help you uh, conduct this model development process at scale? And uh, I'd like to talk about all of those factors uh, in a little bit in the context of this uh, project we've worked on together, Ira. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, and uh, SIGOP, definitely an amazing company if you're looking to optimize models or, or build, build anything at scale in terms of machine learning. Uh, go, go ahead and check them out. Then let's jump into Kevin, Kevin from Tekton. Go ahead. Hi, nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Kevin Stumpf, and I'm the co-founder and CTO of Tekton. Tekton is a, a data platform for machine learning, or really a feature store, which helps solve the hardest and most common data problems around machine learning, meaning how do you turn raw data into features, which you then provide to your models, which are running in production, or to your training pipelines, which are running in your training production system, or to the data scientist who's working in a Jupyter notebook or some other data science environment that I'm sure we're going to talk about here as well, so that they can get access to historical features, train their models with it, and whatnot. Um, before starting Tekton, my co-founders and I, we were all over at Uber, where we built Michelangelo, an end-to-end internal and proprietary machine learning platform that all the data scientists, data engineers, ML engineers, software engineers would use to end-to-end -to -end train an ML model, backtest it, evaluate it, 
and then eventually push it into production and then use it at uber scale in production for really low latency and high scale use cases. Thanks, Kevin. And uh, also also a plug from me on, on, on Tecton, amazing company uh, do, doing great things in the data management field. If, if you're working with, uh, if, if you're stuck with how do I manage my features in production and training and so on, like go ahead and, and check them out. And lastly, uh, my name is Eero Laksan and I'm the CEO of Valohai. We're an MLOps company. What we offer is an MLOps platform. We help companies that build custom machine learning model with models, whether it's like uh, classical machine learning or deep learning. Uh, we help with two major areas uh, being the exploration of models when, when you're working in, in something like a Jupyter Notebooks environment. And then going from there into secondly, productionalizing your training pipelines and deployment of models. And there we take care of two major issues. First of all, orchestration. So pushing your scripts into the cloud, running them on multiple computers at the same time with the hyperparameters we get from Sigopt and the data we get from Tekton and, and running all of that in, in a single place, storing all of that information and then pushing your models into production and versioning versioning all of that. So that that's that's us in short. And uh, I promise you, this is where the plugging plugging will will end and uh, we'll focus more on the beef of the matter. So well, I could I could spend a minute and give a, a plug for Valahai. I had the great fortune of working with Valahai for this uh, NeurIPS competition over the past year. And I will say I loved using the Valahai system. Incredibly impressive, incredibly effective at scaling up to thousands of simultaneous computations happening at the same time, spread out very effectively over machines. Thank you for, for working with us on that exciting project here. Thank you. It, it, it was a blast. Uh, it, it was it was really in, in, some interesting stuff. Uh, if you're interested in optimizing models, go, on, go ahead and check out the white papers that came from that. We worked together with Twitter, Facebook uh, on, on, on a really interesting competition. But yeah, hey, let's get, get into to the topic of the day. So today we're talking about uh, uh, the uh, well topic of MLOps around an ebook that we co-authored with with this group. And uh, uh, the the main principle of the book uh, is talking about or putting the sort of uh, MLOps into into perspective and understanding like what is the uh, what is the core of MLOps and the the, the main statement of the book is, is really that the goal of ML ops is to reduce technical friction to get your models from an idea into production in the shortest possible time with as little risk as possible. So, so we're going to sort of take that principle and then start looking at four major topics today. Uh, from that looking glass, really going, going and looking at First of all, data. How, how do you how do you look at data and managing data from that perspective of again going into production with as little risk and as little technical friction as, as possible and getting getting there as fast as possible. Then workflows like what can you do around workflows, and then standardization. Uh, how does standardization affect this whole uh, whole uh, stack of uh, of machine learning? And then, uh, lastly, performance. How do you how do uh, how do you uh, focus on getting enough performance in a in the in a world that keeps changing around you all the time? And uh, let's start with data. So, uh, of course, one of the, the key uh, key problems is always like getting your data, cleaning up your data, working with your data. Uh, but one of the key key things is, of course, like allowing easy access. Um, and uh, a, a process that allows you to work around data in an efficient fashion. And I, I think that uh, the, the, the one with most credits around this, uh, this should be Kevin. So Kevin, do you want to share some thoughts on, uh, on data in, in production machine learning? Yeah, for sure. And maybe before I go directly into the data field, let's maybe zoom out and say, hey, what is an ML application to begin with? Like, what are the different artifacts you have to keep in mind as you try to get an ML application into production? And to borrow an example that we had at Uber, um, like imagine an Uber Eats or a DoorDash type application that tries to make a prediction along how long is it going to take until the food that you're about to order is going to show up um, at your doorstep. And such an ML application consists really of three different applications or three different artifacts. One is the application which is making the prediction. 
and using the prediction, that would be your microservice that's feeding into the Uber Eats or DoorDash application behind the scenes. Underneath that is the model, which is able to actually make a prediction, take some input parameters, take some input data in order to predict how long is it going to take? Is it going to take 17 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, depending on how busy the restaurant is right now, depending on the restaurant you order from, depending on the location you're at. And then finally, the third piece, and that's the input into the model, is the data, or also the oftentimes referred to as really the features, which is transformed, highly condensed information from the raw data that feeds into the model that makes the prediction, which feeds into your application. So you have to keep all three artifacts, the application, the model, and the data into account before you can develop and productionize an ML application. And data we've seen as one of the hardest things to get right because uh, for really a multitude of reasons, and I'm gonna try to not talk for five hours now about it, but you have to keep in mind, like how do you, to begin with, find the right data as a data scientist? Where do you go? Do you have a data catalog somewhere in the organization you can go to? Does that show you all the relevant raw data that you may need? Then how do you get permissions to that data? Who do you have to talk to? Are there maybe some legal constraints around what you're allowed to use um, given the team you're on, given the problem that you want to solve? Then let's say you got the permission to actually use the data. Now, what do you get? Do you get a CSV dump into your Jupyter notebook, or do you get some one-off credentials to your Snowflake data warehouse, your Redshift, or maybe to some MySQL database? Now, you may have this raw data dump in your Jupyter environment. Now, you turn this raw data into features by running some transformations, which could be just data cleaning operations where you throw out some, some garbage rows, or maybe you're running some aggregations in order to say produce information like what's the 30 minute trailing order count in a given restaurant like you make do all kinds of crazy things in order to make it easier for the for the model to pick up and identify signals that are related and correlated with what you end up trying to predict which could be the order time for for um, the preparation time for an order and now let's say you've got these features that you're happy with. Now you've got a model in your Jupyter environment, which you're happy with. And let's say with Valo High um, or some other tools, you find a way to actually get this model into production too. Now the question is, how do I get features to my model that is running in production, that is running behind some microservice endpoint that needs to make predictions at really, really high scale and really low latency? Is your is your microservice behind the scenes now going to ping your Snowflake data warehouse or your Redshift data warehouse in production? Is it going to run these aggregations um, on the fly? Most likely you cannot do this because these operations are going to take way too long, uh, way longer than the time that you have available to make a prediction. If you want to make a prediction in 50 milliseconds, you're not going to have the luxury of going to your data warehouse and executing a query on the fly, which may take minutes or hours to complete. And so you have to keep all of these different problems um, in mind. How do you get the data, the raw data into your development environment? How do you turn this into features in your development environment? How do you make these features available in your production environment? And then how do you make those features even consistently available in production so that you don't introduce what's oftentimes referred to as train serve skew, where you calculate the features one way in your development environment and then a completely different way in your production environment. If you do this, then your model may look fantastic in your development environment where you run back tests against historical data, but then you throw your model into production and calculate the feature values a different way there. And suddenly your model just doesn't perform well anymore because you've, got, because you've introduced this train serving skew. And so these are all the types of problems that data scientists um, today face as they try to productionize a model. And what you most commonly find for companies that don't use a feature store here is that um, you'd have a data scientist who partners up with a data engineer or a team of data engineers who is actually able to productionize this transformation code, which turns raw data into features and makes the data available in production. Um, now, of course, you have handoffs involved here where data engineers or other teams now have to pick up work from you um, prioritize it on their own, put it on their agenda. And now suddenly it's going to take forever until your model and your data is in production and up and running. Really good points. And I, uh, I think this sort of rings through with, uh, with what, what's in the, uh, 
in the book and sort of the one of the, one of the the foundations on the uh, on the book was a research that we did sort of a large questionnaire on about 300 companies on on their state of machine learning and there we sort of saw this um, um, transition and maturity uh, level and different boxes of companies on on what they were focusing on on next and you could like quite clearly see that the companies that didn't have models in production were really thinking in terms of these blobs of data whereas companies that were already further down in production were thinking more in this dynamic terms of like data flowing through a pipeline that is both for like retraining of models but then also for productionalization and then like trying to figure out how to uh, how to utilize infrastructure to tackle that discrepancy between like uh, here is here's my training environment which is completely different than my training data which is completely different than than my actual production environment all right cool hey uh, how, how about Michael what, what thoughts do you have on uh, on data you know SIGUP lives in a very interesting position it's been designed uh, intentionally so that users do not have to share any data with us, which uh, has its problems in the sense that we can't leverage knowledge necessarily about the data to help uh, accelerate this model development process. But it has its benefits because now customers who are very, very, very secretive, very private, very concerned about their data security can still work with us and still get value out of SIGOPS. As a result, we have, I think, a unique perspective uh, in this concept of uh, not just data, but also uh, what advice we can give about data. And, and yeah, I, I definitely echo uh, the comments from Kevin about the uh, complexity and maturity of data pipelines as companies get deeper into the modeling and uh, model development process. I think that I'd probably uh, supplement that by saying that uh, this question of your train versus production skew or some sort of bias that's built into the model process is something that is, is always going to be uh, potentially present. And realistically, there's no way to perfectly deal with that. And the reason is because at the end of the day, when you build a model, you build it on things you know, but at the end of the day, you want to use your model on things you don't know. You want to use it on the future. You want to use it on data you have not seen. You want to use it to make predictions about circumstances which have not yet occurred. So I think that one of the one of the key elements here is recognizing that that is going to be an issue, that that is going to be a problem, and uh, using that to guide you in your process of retraining or accounting for uh, how much certainty you're willing to put behind your models. And uh, I think that that varies uh, by industry to industry. I think that varies company to company. So I don't think that there's an easy or obvious answer uh, to that particular situation. But I do think it is something that companies need to be aware of. And, and what I often recommend is that uh, customers, before they start worrying about trying to build the fanciest, most complicated model ever, start with something simple. Start with the absolute simplest model and watch even that model drift over time or watch inconsistencies with that model uh, over time and ask yourself, okay, now how am I going to account for that in my data? How am I going to account for that in my uh, training test validation split? How am I going to account for that in the development of my back testing or just in my desire to retrain? Uh, so, so definitely uh, keep it simple at the start, watch that. That'll be guidance for other things. I also wanna expand the term data slightly here to include this topic of what might be called metadata. And, and in particular, this is uh, maybe information about your model development process or information about model building decisions or, or how even your actual data was structured, which isn't itself built into the data, but is a fundamental element of the data uh, pushing into the model, the larger model development process, how this model is interpreted, things like how metrics are being computed, how they're even defined, things as far as how this uh, model was sort of uh, structured or, or motivated or who built it. Because obviously, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, people change at companies. So this, this sort of metadata, a company creating its own data about the model development process, I think can be very, very useful in helping companies with this issue of shift over time or this issue of having to look back six months and, and when this was created, why was it created in a specific way? I, I also think uh, another issue about data can be this issue of uh, data augmentation and this question of uh, how does how does 
data augmentation get dealt with at a variety of different levels. But I think that's something we can talk about in, in a different context in a little bit. So thank you, Vera. Sure, yeah, uh, for, for sure. And, um... And, and uh, continuing on that point of your uh, yours about like metadata and all of the the other data that is ge generated during the process and, and utilization of that, not particularly for actual machine learning, but but to achieve the goal that MLOps is uh, is trying to achieve. Uh, which and is like the, the split there between just machine learning versus the model development, this it, bigger concept here. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So like st stuff like understanding like, uh, or, or or the Docker image that was used for a particular training um, or other output artifacts that might be used, whether it's test reports, whether it's uh, like error reports, logs on uh, pipelines that crashed, all, all, of, all of that stuff. Of course, getting quite far from uh, from the actual like training data, but also data that is related with the process. And and uh, from our point of view, that's like being one of the core value propositions of what, what we sort of talk about a lot. A lot of the time, we we see that uh, a lot of companies do struggle with like how do we manage all of this. All right, hey, uh, I I have a I have a few questions here. First of all, there is uh, Eduardo from Mexico is asking about, you already mentioned uh, this MLOps as something to reduce friction. Then uh, how about uh, technical depth between research and production? Is it possible to consider or talk of, uh, talk of this term when talking about MLOps? Well, uh, I personally think that yeah, yeah, te technical depth is one way to look at sort of uh, uh, sort of the the technical friction that is involved in uh, in getting into production faster and with less risk. I think that technical depth is sort of inherently means risk and slowness of process when things escalate. So, so I, I think that that it's sort of uh, in there. Um, I, I think that it's a very core concept in machine learning. Uh, and ML ops, the whole sort of process that that we're going through as ML ops is starting to emerge. I think started in many ways from the Google paper, which I think was stated something like technical uh, high technical depth uh, in in machine learning being the high risk uh, or, or, or high high. Um, uh, High interest rate credit card. credit card. Yeah, that was the that was the topic. Uh, uh, a really great paper from from the Google research team that sort of started this uh, this process. Um, so, so yeah, I, I definitely think that it 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 should be a part of this. Uh, I see some people raised their hands for asking questions, but uh, can you use the Q and A feature to write your questions so we can pick them up uh, when when they come? Uh, all right, and then. Uh, uh, how Actually, about... maybe really quick about the, I think the technical debt and how to reduce this between research and production is an interesting question. And I think there is much more we can dive into here when we talk about standardization in one of the later chapters of this talk. Um, because at the end of the day, like technical debt is oftentimes introduced when you don't have a standardized process. And what we've seen at Uber and with our customers here at Tecton is that Oftentimes, if you don't have standardized processes, then people build their models, build their feature pipelines, build their data pipelines in one-off bespoke ways that afterwards are extremely hard to manage because they just do it one way that maybe just one person understands and then this person leaves the company. And then afterwards, nobody understands it anymore. There's not a consistent way to solve the same problem over and over again. And that's where standardization comes in. And that's where um, platforms come in that help you actually um, automate away a lot of these problems Tecton feature store helps you um, reduce or minimize the technical debt when it comes to solving the data problems around machine learning and MLOps platforms allow you to reduce um, the technical debt that you would typically introduce when you try to productionize an ML model. Yeah, e exactly, exactly. Uh, then, then I have another question on, uh, on what, what do you guys think? I have, I have seen this, um, very different two types of processes when we talk about like structured and unstructured data and how that flows through a sort of machine learning process. Um, I, I kind of wanted to hear your thoughts on like structured meaning time series or whatever you can put into sort of a database uh, and then unstructured being stuff like images, audio, NLP. Uh, 
we, we sort of see these as very different looking processes from like feature generation point of view, feature management point of view, and, and very different types of tools being adopted in those uh, those fields. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, and then there is also the semi-structured data in between that yes. is not necessarily just unstructured or yeah. fully structured. Um, and yeah, when you talk about data management here and looking at very different tools, it really depends on which parts of the data managed life cycle, management life cycle you look at. You could try to simplify it by looking at extract, transform, and load. Um, of course, with a transform piece of it, yes, you would typically find fairly different tools that transform your structured data versus your unstructured data or your semi-structured data. There's still common um, systems that we oftentimes see, though, to extract, say, the data to begin with, um, whether it's structured, semi, semi-structured, unstructured, for instance, you could use Spark for that. And Spark is pretty good to extract unstructured as well as fully structured data from your data lake or other data sources. And then, yeah, transform piece, you've got way more variance here. And then the load piece is interesting too. Like where do you store, where do you manage this type of data? You would typically see that you've got your data lake, which is um, where you can, that you can actually throw everything at, whether it's fully structured data or fully unstructured data. Data warehouses as of today are more suitable to store structured or semi-structured data. I know there's much more of a push now to actually bring much more unstructured data in. So it's going to be interesting to see a couple of years from now to what extent we would still see this cl this clearer divide of what types of data do you manage in a data lake versus a data warehouse. But as of today, that's how I see the difference between those two or really three categories. I would uh, supplement that with saying, um, from my perspective, at least, when I think about how customers are approaching this, I do see a pretty strong divide between the types of customers who are in particular dealing with uh, times, or at least the types of SIGOP customers who are dealing with time series data versus the types of customers who are dealing with, let's say, image data. And um, uh, obviously, as I mentioned, customers aren't giving us their data, so I don't know exactly what they're doing, but in discussions with them, it does feel that uh, when people are working with time series data, they often seem to be building their own strategies much more frequently than when people are working with, let's say, image data, where perhaps there's this, this wide swath of literature talking about how all of these different tools are already the best thing that you can be creating. Now, some of this may be, uh, let's say, selection bias, and it just happens to be the customers who like to use SIGOP with their time series tend to want to build their own tools or their own methodologies. Uh, but but that is, that is a, a split that I've seen, uh, at least again, among SIGOP customers. And I'm not sure if that trend carries out into larger segments of the ML community. I, I certainly do see that. Uh, but and I, I could go on for, for a long time about that that particular topic, uh, seeing how, how like how differently everything from like augmentation to so on like lo looks in these types of environments. But uh, I, I want to move on uh, move on to the next topic. So so next we were uh, talking about we're going to be talking about workflows and and just to prime that uh, for me it really looks like machine learning in production environments is sort of a super set of uh, the talent you need in building a full stack application so it's like yeah we we're, we're, we're building a, a production environment and production solutions but on top of that we have this weird new concept of data that needs to be uh, up to a certain level of uh, of quality and and there's a the computations are much larger much more complicated all of a sudden you need gpu clusters or you need huge data warehouses and not just that like simple kubernetes cluster where you can shoot your python application or whatever and, and it, you know it works it's, it's not that simple anymore uh, so obviously te the technical workflows that are required to to manage and build these types of systems are going to be much more complicated, uh, and and for instance, I I personally see it as a, a as a big hurdle for data scientists to be able to sort of catch this huge uh, amount of uh, amount of talent that they need to sort of deliver to be able to build systems, and 
uh, I think one of the main points of MLOps is really to uh, take that required full stack capability and, and abstract it away and let you focus on, on a smaller subset that can be actually managed by uh, people outside of that, like 0.001% unicorns that can do everything in the world that we always read about, but don't really exist uh, in, in the real world. Uh, so uh, how, how do you how do you guys see um, sort of workflows uh, workflows around machine learning in production? First, let's let's go with Kevin around like data. How, how do you see that that process happening in uh, in models and, and data? Yeah, definitely. And to me, there is almost like two layers of workflows here. There is the workflow that the data scientist, the person who's responsible for training the model, coming up with features and deploying it is directly seeing. And then there is the underlying technical workflow. And ideally you want to have a system in between that allows the user facing workflow that translates that down to the much more intricate technical workflow under the hood. Um, if you don't have that, then the then the user, the, the data scientist will again have to work with the data engineer to spin up data pipelines, which read the raw data, turn it into features, store it somewhere, and then serve it in production. And so the way we solve this with Tecton, or the way we solved it beforehand at Uber, is that the workflow that the user directly interacts with is um, they would be in their modeling environment, they would connect to their raw data sources, and then they would just define their feature transformation, whether it's a SQL code or whether it's some PySpark code, um, or it's just some Python code by itself that describes how do I want to turn my raw data coming off of a batch source or off of a stream like a Kafka source or a Kinesis source? How do I want to turn this into feature values? And um, then afterwards, they can train their model against it. Now, once they've trained their model against it, they want to now be able to productionize this data. And the way this works with a feature store is that you would typically commit this feature definition, which has a name and which contains the transformation code to your feature store, which then behind the scenes now starts spinning up these far more intricate technical workflows where you would have an orchestration system, which is aware of what types of data pipelines should be running in the moment. Do I need to spin up a Flink pipeline or do you need to spin up a Spark pipeline, which um, at any given moment connects to the raw data source, turns into feature values. Now, what do you need to do with these feature values? Where do I need to put them? Well, most likely if you have a model that's running in production at high scale and low latency, you need to store some of these feature values in a key value store, some data store that is able to um, respond very, very quickly within just a couple of milliseconds. OK, that's great. So you have your feature store solve that problem and productionize the feature values so you can use them in production. But then you also need the ability to fetch later on these feature values to train your model, because you want to take a look at what did the world look like at any given point of time in the past as a data scientist as you train your model. And so these data pipelines, which your feature store manages, they would also take the output of the data pipelines and then store them in a data store where you then later on can go to in order to look at the historical feature values that you then again use to train your model um, while you of course get the guarantee that you're not introducing this train serve skew that we talked a little bit about earlier. So total, totally makes sense. And, and the same, same thing from our point of view, sort of for, for training workflows, again, like just like when you when you want to submit a data transformation, you don't want to manually go ahead and start those uh, like Kafka runs or, or, or Spark jobs and uh, and spin up clusters and so on. The same thing uh, with with us is like when you want to run a notebook on a GPU cluster or GPU machine, you don't want to manually log into AWS and spin up a machine and deploy a Docker image and and then then log in there and uh, and start running and manually put everything down and store your logs in, in between manually and, and to doing all of that sort of DevOps work or a, a manual work in between just to get that notebook running, let be it, it being a production pipeline that needs to be run every 10 minutes uh, on, on large, uh, large scale. So, so definitely a, a lot of touch points there between data and, um, and, and then training. Uh, how about Mike? Any thoughts? My thoughts my thoughts about workflow are that speed matters, consistency matters, 
and uh, consistency is sort of born of uh, maybe communication. It's born of, of documentation. Uh, Kevin just mentioned this question of what did the world look like six months ago? You know, I'm using the, the feature that exists now, but did it look different when somebody trained this model previously? Um, so, so I think that there's, there's important elements, uh, both in terms of going quickly and pushing things faster, but then in terms of consistency and communicating things effectively. And, and realistically, maybe that's, that contributes to or, or is, is in some ways one of the causes of this, this tech debt concept is when you let uh, someone work on their own in their own little setting all by themselves, they may be able to work very fast, but then uh, you know, pushing that into production in a, in a consistent solid fashion, communicating the results of, of what happened is more complicated. It is maybe then uh, less consistent or that is the part that then becomes slow. Uh, so I think that one key element here as far as having an effective model development workflow is this question of collaboration. How is it that you are documenting things that are going on? How is it that you are documenting the, the shift in things over time and are, are doing so in such a way that um, people in various different aspects of your, your work and speak about that. And I know we're gonna talk more about this later, but I'm bringing it up now because I think that this does affect workflow. And I think that in, in, this, in this context then, it can affect people's workflows who in their mind feel, they know what they like, they know how they like to work. And so it, it can be uh, very much uh, a personal experience then your workflow, the way you like to push things forward, the way you like to dev things. And, but it can cause friction with the larger workflow of trying to push things into production. So in that context, I think, I think it is pertinent in this topic. Uh, parallelization and just this question of developing multiple models simultaneously or, or more, more likely within the development process, parallelizing different aspects of this workflow, different aspects of feature development or different aspects of hyperparameter decision making. I think that the parallelization is a key element in making sure things are going as quickly as possible while still keeping things documented. There's obviously this sort of trade-off mathematically as far as going to a higher parallelism as things are going on. Somehow things are in flight with less information than you'd like them to be. But at the end of the day, I think that's one of the best ways to speed things up uh, without losing this ability to communicate and document things. And, and, and really, I'm going to I'm just mention one of our customers who, who talked about uh, a large consulting firm that talked to us about really a, a 30%, they saw a productivity gain. And they claim this is a productivity gain by being able to cut down from maybe multiple days to just uh, maybe 20 hours worth of time in this model development process through coming up with a better workflow, through coming up with a workflow where, where things are being done sampled efficiently with parallelization and where things are being effectively documented so that it's easier to look things up and push things forward. So I, I will definitely say that a solid workflow we've seen, and we've had customers come to us that a good workflow has given them tangible benefits that they've been able to document. And I think I want to double down on this really quick. I think this, um, the importance of speed here, Michael, that you brought up is super, super important because like we've actually seen um, both at Uber beforehand when we started, um, before we built Michelangelo, the ML platform right there, where it would actually take six months or 12 months to get an ML model into production. We see the same thing with a lot of uh, our customers before we engage with them. And it's, it's not just where you actually now suddenly are twice as fast, but it's several orders of magnitude faster what you can accomplish by actually providing a great workflow to the customer, a great standardized workflow to the customer, which we're going to talk about in a second, which then allows you to automate a ton of stuff that gives you this multiple orders of magnitude of a speed up, which at the end of the day allows the data scientists to really rapidly iterate on their ideas, put them out in produ into production and test them, which you really need to do as a data scientist where you're experimenting with things by the definition of your job where you don't really know ahead of time whether your model is going to actually perform well in production. And if you always have, a, have to wait six months or even a couple of days, it's going to drastically slow down your, your productivity and you wanna do whatever you can to put great workflows in front of the user, standardize them, automate them, so you can shrink it as much as possible down to basically the speed and the efficiency that we're now used to as software engineers where we can write a line of code and get into production literally within minutes. 
yeah, and I think that that sort of contains the whole core of what's happening in this um, ML ops uh, space. I think it's just the same development that we saw in software development in the last like maybe 20 to 30 years where a hero coder, uh, Mike mentioned, like this person who can alone move fast and get stuff maybe done uh, in a relatively short period of time. But when, when the complexity requires you to have more than one people working on it, it all falls apart uh, when you don't have standardization. And then, of, of course, the, on the other, other hand, uh, we, we now think of these old ways of working uh, very inefficient, where, where you have to sort of uh, wait for a long time for any code to be tried out and so on. Or like I see customers that have that have training times of three weeks, two weeks, something like this, and, and just like training time alone. And, and they think it's fine. And then you sort of put it into an Excel sheet and look at the return on investment and you realize that, okay, may maybe it's not a good idea. Um, yeah, uh, and that, that brings me to my, my next question. Do you have any any awesome like dirty stories from the from the fields? So I would love to hear a few like really bad workflows. We've been talking about good workflows, but any real world examples on, uh, on stuff that, that you've seen in the wild? I'll I'll give one. I, this is this is a little dirty. I've I mean I I at the end of the day maybe it did something for them, but in particular speaking from this uh, hyperparameter optimization perspective, making these decisions, uh, we actually did have uh, one uh, prospect uh, at the time converted into a customer eventually, um, who was choosing every parameter uh, independently of every other parameter. So so this customer would would choose. 10 different values for learning rate, pick whichever one was the best, and then fix that, and then go to momentum, and then pick 10 different values for that, whichever one was the best, and then would go to uh, the, the dropout uh, number and uh, pick whichever one was best, and then and then bounce between that. I think there was one other parameter, and they, they keep doing this. Um, and, and you know what? At the end of the day, it was working for them. They were, they were, they were happy with that partly because they didn't know they could be doing better. But then they started to talk to us, they realized, oh, actually these things have some sort of joint interaction. And if you if you do that strategy, you'll get something. I mean, it's not gonna be the end of the world, but but you could do a lot better with that. And, and really that's an, I just, it was, it was an important uh, realization for me, realistically, because I had just assumed, oh, it's obvious that if you think about all these parameters simultaneously with each other, things will be a lot better. It's not obvious. And if you, if you do not, uh, communicate that to people, and if and for people out there watching, uh, if you're not aware of this, uh, there is a lot of complexity in this process of choosing intelligent parameters, and especially choosing intelligent parameters maybe from different parts of your workflow. Uh, you can do all these things independently, and you will get something, and it may be fine, but it may not be fine. And if you work under the assumption during your development process that things that are actually fine are not fine because they're being executed in the wrong way, you are going to hurt yourself. You are preventing yourself from seeing the maximum return from your model development process. And, so and that would be take more time, right? Well, in addition, or it either takes multiple time or you spent the same amount of time but got a much worse result. Yeah, yeah, and and that's really that's really I think the thing that I would emphasize about the workflow thing is that um, you know do your research. There are people out there talking about what are the right strategies, what are the right mechanisms for your particular problem. Read up on it and make sure that you have a sense of what makes the most sense because otherwise you're selling yourself short and you're not doing as well as you could be. All right. Kevin, any dirty stories? Don't have to share if, if, if it's more <laughs> confidential. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, just if you look at how the data problems around machine learning are solved today, like they are all very painfully solved if you don't have a data platform for ML or a feature store in production. Because again, what you see is the data scientist build something in their Jupyter notebook using some, using some Python code. And now they have to go over to this data engineer or the ML engineer who now re-implements at some point in the future everything that the data scientists already did to now calculate everything differently in production. And it's almost as if you imagine that a software engineer for any new feature that they're going to develop, they first implement it in Python. It's one person. And then that person is now completely hands off as this capability gets put into production and that 
that developer now just hands basically this Python code to some Java engineer who re-implements everything again, who's now ultimately responsible for it, who may not even understand the business logic in the first place, but just line by line goes through it and translate the code from Python to Java, then puts it in production and who's then responsible for the uptime, the reliability and the functionality of this thing. And it's it's basically absurd. And that's what you still see in, in, in lots of places where they are trying to solve the data problems around ML without a feature store. Uh, I, uh, I, I couldn't have put it in, a, in, a, in any better way. Uh, but it's totally, totally what's happening. I, I have one, one dirty story uh, quickly. It's, uh, it, it's a, I think it's a classic on anybody who's doing deep learning and GPUs. Like I've, I've had, and I have heard this story so many times, but, but like people uh, end up uh, leaving clusters on, uh, on cloud environments. And, and the biggest, uh, biggest invoice I've heard of was twenty thousand over a weekend for for no no compute being done whatsoever on AWS and then like uh, they had a little bit of a talk with supervisors <laughs> on Monday when they realized it but so, so this can rack up some pretty pretty big uh, big costs okay but hey we have to we have to jump jump forward I'll I'll take a few quick questions. Uh, here first, I have two uh, questions that are around workflows and especially CI/CD. Uh, Henrik uh, from Henry from Brazil is asking, how can automated tests be inserted uh, in the context of ML ops? Are tools used the same as usual CI/CD? Uh, and I could maybe take that one since what we kind of call ourselves is CI/CD for machine learning. Uh, I, I think that the, the main principle and ideology behind everything is the same. Uh, the, the things that where, where we see traditional CI CD tools break down, and I've, by the way, seen uh, Jenkins workflows built to, to run, run machine learning, and to a certain extent it can work. Uh, but when you start getting larger amounts of data, uh, you start needing more complex compute, uh, you start so so like it's pretty hard to spin up a GPU cluster uh, from uh, from Jenkins uh, and, and make, make it make it effective. Uh, on on top of that, it's it's pretty hard to manage what was the version of data, what was the partic what were the particular output artifacts from a particular like training run that when then went to the next step of testing and this data flow that you need to have in your uh, so machine learning workflow, the pipeline where data flows doesn't really exist in CI CD context for software development. And that's, that's where the things start breaking down. Uh, and then there was another question that was basically, basically the same thing on CI CD. Uh, anybody else have anything on, on this or want to comment? Uh, uh, yeah, I just want to add really quick. I think this is actually super important. Like you want to be able to drive your ML ops or your uh, full ML productionization process with a CI CD pipeline and CI CD process. And the same thing applies to solving the data problems for machine learning. And I, I published a blog post about this uh, last year, which is called DevOps for ML data, which I think is the key to actually really speeding up the development and the deployment of ML applications and solving the data problems under the hood. And the way we solve this with Tekton, for instance, is that um, you actually define all your your features and the feature transformations in a declarative way in files. They're just backed by your Git, GitHub repository or wherever you want to store it. And then you have a CI CD pipeline, which uses a little CLI that Tekton provides, which you can use to run tests against the feature definitions and which you also use to then productionize the feature definition, which you will also use to roll back any changes that you've made. So what you're now able to do is you can create a new feature definition, check it into Git, have a pull request, have somebody else um, review it, merge it into master, merge it into your staging branch, kick off a CI CD pipeline, test the feature definitions. And then when you're happy with, with uh, and you've got successful tests, you then productionize the, the features, push them into production, which then behind the scenes actually spins up the data pipelines. And now everything uses the exact same workflow and the exact same tools that you're used to for your software development process around Git and CI CD pipelines. Really great point, and I think we're getting getting close to this concept of it used to be infrastructure as code. Now, now I think we're gonna start seeing like data as code. Exactly. And then, then, uh, then on the other hand, uh, what 
we think in the same exact terms for like running the processes of training and, and running testing and augmentation and, and so on on data uh, and, and pre building models and production visualizing or uh, pu pushing models into production. The same thing, like every definition needs to be in code. They need to be committed to Git. They need to be tested. They need to be reproducible so that when you have those features and you use them in, in your training pipeline, all of that is actually documented from raw data all the way to the actual model that runs in production. And you can always backtrace if something breaks down upstream, you can always call to any of those points and pull that, let's say, to your exploration environment and start working in Jupyter Notebooks to understand, is my data wrong? Is my code wrong? What's happening here? Okay, hey, let's, let's move to the next topic of the day. Uh, there's a lot of questions, but uh, I'll, I'll pull, pull some in, in at some point, but we need to get through the agenda. Uh, so standardization. Uh, so uh, one of the, the sort of issues that we've already maybe, maybe talked about here a little bit is where, when, where do we want to allow as much free flexibility around tooling and working uh, with data, building models, uh, solving those business issues and where do we want to draw the line so that your organization can actually grow and uh, maybe um, sort of talking about standardization in machine learning uh, the way i see it it's like i mentioned the same thing that happened in software development which is sort of how do we go from these hero developers into teams that can grow exponentially so that we can also deliver exponentially if we look at companies like for instance, Facebook, who at, at the height of their growth probably recruited thousands of people over, over a month and still had those people be effective in building that software. How do we build a standard enough environment so that you can do that on the data side and on the machine learning side too? And how do we how do we still allow as much flexibility as possible? This is a drastically fast changing, fast paced environment like what we, for instance, see that when we started, uh, TensorFlow almost didn't exist. It was a joke. Uh, then uh, like everybody was, TNO is the, the coolest thing out there. Now it's been like maybe five generations of different frameworks that were the king uh, in just a few years. Uh, so what we ended up doing is drawing the line in sort of, uh, you can use whatever tool there is uh, on, on, so everything runs on Docker. So there's already good tools out there that ha give you a good point of abstraction. Uh, we, we chose Docker. So whatever you tool you want to use, you can, but you also have to deliver the image that can reproduce those results. So, so, so sort of, uh, yeah, you can use whatever you want, but you also have to make sure that the next guy who's coming into this project can also do it. Um, how about how about uh, Mike? Do you have any any thoughts on standardization and, uh, and both? Uh, one one sort of uh, larger thought, which is that uh, standardization is extremely important for this onboarding process. Exactly as you mentioned, in the context of Facebook, mm -hmm. it's also important in this churn process where you're losing people potentially. Uh, Salesforce talks about this from this perspective of when your salespeople are leaving they're stealing from you because they're taking their Rolodex with them out of the company. And that was their key pitch to companies is make them put their Rolodex in the database. The same logic in some ways applies here. Obviously there's, I don't think there's a nefarious sense to things so much in the ML process, but I do think it is a very common situation. People come in, people leave, you know, I mean, the half-life of a, a data scientist, state engineer in some of these places, a couple of years, maybe even less in some places. So you, you have to deal with that. And, and standardization is one mechanism for dealing with that. Uh, the, the elements of this that I'm going to say, and this isn't a tool, but this is something we talk about a lot with our customers, is it has, it has to really have buy-in at the top and it has to have buy-in every port down the food chain. Because if individuals don't feel supported by their management, then they are just going to do whatever they're happy with. And that's that's what ML people oftentimes have grown up with right now in the current state of the world, is they've done what they feel comfortable with because that's how they got their current job, was doing what they do best, not standardizing on some broader tool that exists at the company. And then to push that higher, the only way you can get this standardization is if somebody higher up in the food chain says, guys, this is what we have to do, but not just says it, gets the buy-in 
from everybody else in the company gets this desire to work in this flow. So I guess that's more meta than some sort of technical product, but that's been the main discussion we've had with our customers is it's like, look, believing in standardization isn't a person by person thing. This has to be an organizational decision. Yeah, I think if you, sorry, do you want to respond to that? No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think if you want to make it really easy for people in your company to use machine learning in production, there is no way around standardization. The simple reason for that is that standardization leads to automation and allows for automation. And automation leads to rapid iteration. And as we've established earlier, you need to be able to iterate rapidly in order to make progress with ML really, really quickly. And oftentimes people think, oh, there is this one-to-one trade-off between, um, say, standardization and and flexibility. But uh, and often or the speed that you get out of it. But oftentimes you can just limit the flexibility a little bit, like go from 100% flexibility to just 90% flexibility, and vastly speed up all your workflows, you get like a 10x, 100x speed improvement of getting things into production if you just limit the flexibility a tiny bit. That's what we saw with Michelangelo at Uber, where you had 20 ML training algorithms to choose from and not anything possibly in the world. As a result of that, people were able to train their models and get them into production within just a couple of hours. The same thing with Tekton and our feature store, where yes, like you can use SQL, PySpark, and Python to uh, to express your feature transformations, but not any possible way, any possible other language. And as a result of that, you get your data into production, again, within hours rather than weeks or longer than that. The, <clears throat> great, great point. Uh, let's see, uh, do we have any questions here regarding the topic? Uh, so here's here's one on the on the Salesforce example. Uh, so on the Salesforce example, uh, is it the data that is more important when you move companies, or the training model that filters the data? I can understand owning the data, but should algorithms be protected, or should the design be designer be allowed to walk away? And I think here, uh, well, Michael, you can also answer in your own words, but I think what. What Mike was trying to say is not that you're stealing the company's data or you're you're stealing the, the company's IP. It's more that when a data scientist leaves, it's a matter of whether they leave a notebook with a desktop full of Jupyter Notebooks files that are named like untitled one underscore best score underscore old and, and and then you have like absolutely no idea how they came up with the models that they they generate and again another dirty story that i've actually seen in the real world uh, but but they leave an actual standardized process uh where somebody else can then come in and, and continue working on that is that right michael yeah that's that's exactly right i'm not so much talking about ownership of the idea so much as documentation can other people follow what you did reproduce what you did or did you effectively just leave them with yeah sure a notebook that's untitled underscore one under title underscore best underscore old underscore redone underscore yeah that's which i mean i'm guilty of that too i have done that in the past but as an organization you have to strive to want to get past that and if you do there are benefits uh for doing so cool all right uh I don't think we have any any other questions on that topic. So let's let's get to the the, the last topic of the day, which is uh, performance. So we're gonna just uh, we're, we're gonna finish at just over an hour, uh, so going a little bit past. Uh, getting getting your models into uh, to perform in production, I think that there's there's so many things that uh, that relate to it, whether it's data quality to uh, changes in the world, whether your model affects the behavior of people, and then you have that coming in as a feedback. There's so many things. Uh, I, I think if we're talking about like performance and optimization, of course, like Sigop, you're, you're the king, kings of this uh, space. So I, I'll give, give this first to Mike. To give you a I, I think that yeah, optimization of metrics is extremely important. But for me, and when I'm discussing things with customers and prospects, the most important thing at the beginning is the definition of metrics. People have to agree that there is 
something which is actually pertinent in a business context. And that agreement needs to be sort of shared across a variety of different stakeholders at the company. So this, this definition of metrics and agreement of value in metrics is, is the most important step in the process. Because if you go out and optimize a metric that you thought was valuable and it turned out that it was actually not correlated with business success or even somehow negatively correlated, which we have seen at our company, customers thought some metric was really valuable. It was negatively correlated with business success and they were really confused. And, and that's, that's just part of the process is that if you optimize the wrong thing, you're gonna really hurt yourself. Beyond that, yeah, studying multiple metrics at the same time, I think is extremely important. And whether you're studying those multiple metrics in the context of trying to study this trade-offs and understand the trade-offs that have to be taken between metrics, or whether you're imposing them as sort of thresholds, minimum performance thresholds, and then saying, well, I want good outcomes that satisfy uh, at least this inference speed, no more than this power consumption, no more than this model size, at least this accuracy, no more than this number of false positives on this class. I think incorporating all of those metrics into your process is very valuable and gets you closer to immediately recognizing business value. I to totally, totally agree with that. I, I have, I have another story from the fields. I just had a had a talk with a friend, uh, friend who's a who, who's a senior data scientist, and, and and he told me what's the difference between him being a junior and and a senior. When he was a junior, he was building a lot of models. Uh, requested by by business and as a senior what what he's doing is he's asking why and and not not building models anymore at all because like he's just <laughs> asking like why do you need the, need this metric what? and then they're like mm, good point <laughs> that is that is exactly what i'm talking about and if you can build the one right model instead of trying a million different things you can get more buy-in from different stakeholders at your company yeah totally yeah. totally I couldn't agree more with that. And the interesting thing to me is like what we've seen is that once you then have a model that is the right one that can actually drive the right business metric, then typically it's not actually the model running in production that breaks anymore. Like we know how to manage this artifact in production, how to serve predictions behind a microservice. And then when it goes down, we can restart it. Those are fairly solved problems. However, what happens is not the model breaks, but the data breaks. And so now the model initially, yes, it was performing well, but eventually the performance starts to degrade. And there can be so many reasons for that. Typically, the, the reasons that we see are the data reasons. And the most obvious one is that maybe the world is just changing. And your model, as we talked about earlier, when you trained it, only looked at what the world looked like at any given point of time in the past. But now the world is changing as the model is running in production. So suddenly it hasn't seen these patterns of the new reality ever beforehand when it was trained. And so you need to now retrain your model. And so how do you even know to begin with whether you have to do this? And typically what you want to do there is you want to look at the distributions of your features when you trained your model and the distribution of those features when you're making predictions in production. For numerical features, does the mean roughly look the same? Does the standard deviation roughly look the same? Or for categorical features, what categories did you see when you trained your model? What categories do you now see in production as you're making predictions? If the, the, the feature distributions, the categories get massively out of whack, the only thing you can expect for the model to do is to perform pretty poorly. And that is now a sign for you that you have to retrain your model against the new state of the world. And of course, other more obvious problems are you may just have an outage. Like there may just be upstream, suddenly no, no new data gets landed anymore. And so now you only have uh, basically garbage features in production. So you get the, the typical garbage in, garbage out types of predictions. So now you have to go up and find the owner of the data pipeline who now goes in and fixes it. And it can get even worse than that, where what we, what we sometimes see is where you have subpopulation outages, where um, your model may actually perform pretty well in the US, but it doesn't perform super well in Finland right now. And you only look at the performance metrics globally, and there's just more predictions happening in the US than there are in Finland. And so overall, things look still fairly healthy. But once you start zooming into the subpopulation, you'd notice, oh, crap, we have a pretty bad outage in Finland, so somebody should go in there and fix it. And unless you have right data monitoring and feature monitoring in place as well, you're probably going to be in for a for a hard time to identify and debug those issues. Yeah, I I, I totally agree, and 
And I could maybe maybe join in on that sort of world changing. I, I often get asked by like more uh, junior organizations, like companies that are just starting their journey in, in machine learning, like what does this mean that the world is changing? And I guess the answer is anything and everything. Uh, and I think that a lot of people think that world changing meaning like that there's a fundamental change in the behavior of humans, for instance. That's not usually what it means. It can be that. But it can also be dust uh, on on the the factory floor going on your cameras. Uh, it can be somebody pushing a new version of uh, of production code that replaces the distribution of some value from one to zero to one to a hundred by accident. It can be a new version of a sensor coming from a, a vendor where the specification is that the vibration will be from zero to one but then the the value will actually be from one to 100 again like there's there's so many different things and it, it, it it's often not the actual like behavior of human people it's actually just something upstream in your data input or your code that is changing and you just don't notice it because the systems get so complicated that it's completely impossible to, to understand this. <clears throat> All right, um, any, any, any thoughts, thoughts on this uh, while I look at some questions, if we have anything good coming. Now is a good time to enter your final questions before before we close up the stream. Yeah, any any last questions, anybody? Oh, somebody asked for the reference, I see for the, I don't remember the exact reference, but it was something like machine learning is the high interest credit card of something. I think if you Google that, you'll probably find it. Yeah. I don't remember exactly what it was. Machine called. learning, technical depth and high interest is what I used to find the yes. paper. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there it is. On Google. Yeah. You, you will That's find exactly it. It's, it's by Google. And they actually wrote three papers on it, I think, like building on top of each other. And the final yeah. one was, I think, uh, the rubric for machine learning. So this sort of uh, framework for testing your whole machine learning pipeline, all the way from like data testing into production monitoring. And sort of the, mm -hmm. the first principles in, in that. It's very thorough and it gives you a lot of perspective because they did a survey, they built this, the, the rubric on like, this is the level that we think is, is like what things should be done at. And then they did a questionnaire inside Google from different teams that were doing machine learning at Google and everybody scored horribly. So, so like if, if you're not doing well uh, with the subject that we talked about today, you're not alone. Even the best in the bad. world are struggling with this. It's a new topic. It's a new world. It's very complicated. Luckily, now we're getting tools that are making it easier. You're, it's, it's no longer you have to code your own version control software, for instance, like it, mean, like it used to be at some point uh, for, for software development. Now we're starting to see these, uh, these tools emerge that, that make it easier. Yes. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll take one uh, final question from here. Uh, any recommended techniques for retraining model and data drift? And I, I think, Kevin, do you have any, any thoughts on data drift? I mean, basically, just uh, continuing what I said earlier, like you need to have the right monitoring in place to begin with in order to identify model drift or data drift. And then you need to have the right automation in place, which is listening for those changes in data. And then this automation now needs to have the ability to kick off your ML ops, your CI CD pipeline, which is now able to actually retrain your model and push it in production. So you can wire all of this up. It's not too trivial to do it. Um, and we've done it at Uber. We help our customers with Tekton to do it too. Um, but that's basically, these are the, the rough steps that you have to go through in order to enable it. Cool. Hey, uh, any other closing words? Thank you. Thank you for uh, hosting here. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody, for your attendance. Uh, this, is, this is really amazing. Uh, a, a lot of interesting topics, uh, a lot of great questions. A recording will be out, so, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, if you're interested in the topics, there is the ebook that is available. Uh, you can go on uh, at least our website. I think every, uh, everybody's website should have it uh, to find the ML, MLOps 
uh, practical MLOps ebook. It, it contains a lot of information on uh, on the high level topics discussed here and goes goes a lot deeper and gives you gives you more uh, more things to think about. So thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Take care.